fantastic welcome to this uh, other EBBF uh, International Learning Dialogue. And this is a special one because uh, it's not just EBBF, but Carmel Irandust. Hi, Carmel. You are part of making this happen. And you had a big question for us. Today is UN Peace Day. And we thought, let's have a conversation about peace. peace. What does actually what does peace actually mean? And so Carmel, as a co-organizer, uh, we have Rhonda Gossen, we have Maya Goroff, and we'll start to exchange a little dialogue and have some deepening questions about this concept of peace. Without forgetting that each one of these people has been living, has been operating in places where peace does not uh, exist. So we really want to go beyond the theory and really understand and really go deep on this theme. So let's start by introducing Carmel. Can you just briefly introduce yourself and why did you decide to have this uh, event? Sure. Um, thank you, Daniel, and thank you to the EBBF for such a, a wonderful opportunity to celebrate peace. Well, first of all, welcome to each one of you to this wonderful day. Uh, the United Nations have installed this day 40 years ago, and they said that for 24 hours, we hope that there will be no conflict in the world. And uh, today, 40 years later on, I'm not sure if it, this is true and if conflicts actually pause, but I thought with you, Daniel, that maybe it's a wonderful opportunity for us to reflect on what peace means, how can we achieve it, what are the enemies of peace, and also uh, what we can do at our own you know, level. Um, we love to speak about the higher level, which is about the countries of the world, the government. We love to wonder about the wording and what does peace really mean? But what about the second level, which is really what I can do no? in my own uh, area, in my own life? So we will together go at the three levels. What does the word mean? How can I do it at my own level? And what does it mean at a bigger level? So thank you so much to Rhonda and Maya, and I cannot wait to hear about the learning and the experience. Thank you, Carmel. And let's get started. So Maya, Rhonda, let's start with Maya. How have you been creating peace? How have you been, been involved in peace over the next, uh, over the last few years? Mm, whoa, that's a big, quite a lot of pressure. <laughs> no, well, as, as you know, I've, I've been working um, mostly at the international level, not only, but mostly. Um, so I've been working in and around international legal institutions in The Hague, uh, in, uh, international criminal tribunals, but also in treaty negotiations, like making sure we have binding international treaties to resolve international cross-border problems. So basically setting the foundations for like very systematized, entrenched international cooperation. Uh, with all countries in the world. So uh, different diverse countries with um, different religious traditions. For example, I've worked a lot uh, with countries uh, that have a Sharia law or Islamic based or influenced legal system, worked all over the Asian region, Latin America, Africa, um, uh, everywhere. <laughs> and yeah, so that, and, 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 and in that work, um, I think there's like a, there's definitely a, a dual or triple, like there's, there's of course the international framework and sphere, but there's also the very basic human person to person dimension of peace, creating the kitchens for peace, uh, where you see the, the fellowship and even love among, um, you know, international officials, negotiators getting together, that so enjoy and are passionate about collaboration and there's there's just like it's its own energy of of uh different international people working together to solve problems so it's been very positive and affirming in that way that yeah. and i love because you're really mentioning these three levels now the level of you are creating the treaties and the conditions for peace you're then looking at the criminal court where if peace doesn't occur, something will happen as a consequence, but also this uh, in-between level, not the human relationship of the people both in the courts and in these uh, big governance uh, events that really, as on a human level, understand each other and try to find the ways forward for peace. Very curious to ask you a number of questions, Maya. Thank you very much. And Rhonda, how are you bringing peace to the world? Where have you been operating? Where are you operating? Interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, following from, from Maya's point, you know, I also, I work for the UN in crisis response and refugee response around the world and mostly in conflict and conflict zones. And uh, so I, I come at it from a slightly different angle, you know, looking at what we're doing at community 
based level. And um, really we're kind of guided in our work by a mantra called the humanitarian peace development nexus, sorry, the humanitarian development peace nexus, <laughs> which everybody says, well, what does that mean? You know, what is that? And we're all struggling, you know, what does that mean in practice? But really what it means is, you know, we're, we're having, providing humanitarian assistance at the same time as fostering socioeconomic development of communities and also peace building initiatives really mostly targeted to the poor, the most vulnerable, you know, the most unstable communities um, in, in countries such as Afghanistan, for example, or South Sudan. So um, we're sort of working simultaneously. It's not a, it's not a continuum of, you know, peace development and et cetera. It's a, it's a simultaneously approach towards collective outcomes to really reduce in inequities um, and vulnerabilities really at the community and, and local levels, sort of laying a foundation for long-term peace building. Um, this really practical work, you know, it, it, it translates itself into, you know, making sure basic essential services are, are functioning, that local economies are functioning, that people have livelihoods, that um, we're providing cash-based assistance in emergency situations to help stabilize communities so they can move towards more resilience. You know, the, the other mantra is sort of building resilience of communities, um, building capacities of institutions, of individuals, and of communities. And, you know, in Afghanistan, it's very interesting, we're looking right now at, uh, at how we can do this in a situation where, you know, the Taliban have taken over, the Americans have left, um, you know, the country has suffered from 40 years of war. You know, now you have a country that's teetering on the verge of economic and social collapse. And, you know, many countries are not wanting to work with the Taliban. We're very uncertain about the situation. But the UN has said, you know, we're staying, we're gonna deliver, we're gonna be there for the people of Afghanistan. So, you know, we're struggling with what that means or how to do it, but we know it means working at the community level strengthening community-based institutions, civil society, working through NGOs, um, you know, working, bringing actors together uh, for dialogue at a local level to find their own solutions, you know, but at the same time, providing that sort of immediate basic needs, humanitarian assistance. So this is, this is sort of where I'm coming from. And I've seen this kind of work go on in all conflict zones, you know, whether it's South Sudan, even Lebanon and the Syria refugee crisis, uh, the Rohingya crisis was sort of, that was actually a, a special situation, but it's, it's really looking at practical ways that you initially at least stabilize people's lives. And, um, but I'd like to talk more at, at some point about the social cohesion peace building initiatives at community level, because I think that's really the heart of it. And I'm not sure if I'm happy or sad that you've been in so many conflict zones. I'm happy because we get some real insights. I'm very sad that so many conflict and lack of peace zones happen. And you mentioned this connection between the human, uh, the individual, the community and the institutions and how the three go forward and the dialogues. And of course, Maya, you've been part of, uh, you've been part of many of these dialogues and treaties and uh, meetings where these three levels are actually put into play. Are there some elements of peace that are more sensitive that arise more often? There are more, uh, there are more debates in these global meetings when these treaties are being set. Is this something that comes up in this area? Yeah, I think from a very macro perspective, the two examples I would give, which I think are very interesting, also for people to know about, generally in, in creating the overall um, conditions for peace in the world firstly would be to do with the UN Security Council and then um, international rule of law. So the UN Security Council is tasked with addressing situations in the world where international peace and security is, is threatened, yet uh, the power relationships on the <laughs> Security Council are very sensitive and, and delicate and indeed have remained uh, frozen in time since 1945 when the UN Charter was first negotiated. So it's this question of, of, of power relationships, geopolitics, and having sort of a, a locked in power structure where a certain number of countries have a veto power in the UN Security Councils. So it's often hamstrung and cannot actually address uh, situations in, in as an effective way as, as it could if it were you know, better governed and configured. So many of these conflict situations that Rhonda and others if there was like a progressive enhancement of the Security Council to make it really an instrument fit for purpose, uh, not focused on power and you know kind of competitions for power, this would 
really be a huge step forward for peace in the world. And just quickly, secondly, um, international rule of law. Um, the International Court of Justice is was the primary uh, uh, judicial organ for the United Nations established in 1945, but to date only for uh, about 40%, a little less than 40% of UN member states have accepted its compulsory jurisdiction. Um, and this would mean that the court just has jurisdiction over any disputes among states. So, and this, you know, rule of law and, and peacefully settling disputes among states rather than resorting to conflict uh, and war was, you know, basically the main principle of, of ensuring a, a stable peace in the world. So this is like a huge gap, of course, <laughs> that, that states, you know, find it still very sensitive or, or, or they find it um, uh, a big step to to accept international oversight. However, it would it would help the whole collective if they did. And you see similar dynamics, for example, with the International Criminal Court, or there's there are also proposals for a new international anti-corruption court. And overall, it would greatly improve the 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 governance of the world across countries at the international level. But um, States and, and leaders are 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 resistant. They're they're sometimes because they are in fact you know corrupt or involved in corruption. So so you have this tension of you know power structures at the national level, and then you know new international mechanisms or strengthened international governance that would really help everybody and populations around the world. But there's there there is a lot of resistance. And the resistance, obviously, you mentioned some really important key elements. You mentioned corruption power, the rule of law, without which peace is really difficult to put into play. And I think, Rhonda, you mentioned uh, before this building the resilience, but my question is, you've been there, you've been in Rohingya, you've been in, Rohingya, you've been in Bangladesh, you've been in Afghanistan. How do you build that resilience when there's injustice, when there's corruption, where things are, where the wrong kind of power is being used? What have you found to be the elements to bring justice in this uh, peace in these kind of uh, situations? Well, I think it, it fundamentally, um, people's basic essential needs have to be met. That's one. Um, you know, if, if, you know, that is that essential services have to be there, basic needs have to be there. Um, you know, that's, that's one thing. I mean, of course, trying to enhance livelihoods, jobs, you know, uh, even supporting entrepreneurs, small micro type enterprises, you know, ways that people can have a little bit of feel that they have some, you know, capacity to cope and, and transcend. Um, but, you know, coupled with that is, is the area of social cohesion that I mentioned, you know, the areas of dialogue of, of capturing people's voices and, and solutions and trying to find collaboration across tensions, um, you know, and, and trying to find platforms where at least there can be dialogue. You could bring in, you know, local social justice uh, actors, in, uh, law enforcement actors with community members to, to at least, um, you know, discuss issues, have voices, trying to amplify voices of women and youth, I think is really critical in many of these countries. Um, you know, especially women. I mean, we know the gender equality issues around instability and we know gender equality is a barrier to peace um, and, and we've seen it more strongly all the time I mean the you know there's recent research coming out showing that a country that has very serious oppression of women's rights also is very very prone to violence and instability and insecurity um, so you know these correlations are very strong in Pakistan where I worked you know it, it's very interesting to track the rise of violent extremism in that country which mirror the dramatic drop in gender equality indicators and the increase in gender-based violence. So that correlation was there and um, it's proven. So I think now it's not just a question of having women around uh, a, a peace table where the women peace and security agenda that you know in the areas Maya's working features, but it's, it's beyond that. It's women's participation at all levels uh, that's critical. And I really don't want to lose this key element for me in any case, which is the role of fem women, female leadership. And Maya, you've been in so many conversations where men, women are present and where men, women are absent, either physically or not treated as being present in the room, which is even worse. So can you tell me something about what you have perceived about the role of female leadership in actually reaching peace, moving forward in these dialogues? What is different? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, at many different uh, levels, of course, this is such an important issue. And at, at the sort of like institutional level in international justice uh, institutions, legal institutions in The Hague, for example, I know for a fact, you know, previous prosecutors at the, the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, um, you know, lawyers working um, in the office of the prosecutor noted when there was female leadership, a lot of the conflicts were diffused <laughs> in terms of the competition. It was kind of certain certain um, uh, women leaders were notable or, you know, very kind of uh, known for sort of diffusing this very competitive, you know, hyper-masculine um, attitude or, or environment. Um, and, and now there's been a recent independent experts re review of the International Criminal Court and also its working environment and saying that, uh, you know, there are problems with gender discrimination and uh, har harassment, sexual harassment. So it's like a culture, again, like this kind of culture that needs to be um, corrected so it is a safe place for women. And also, if that culture is in fact built, it will benefit the whole uh, institution. And just another note, um, yeah, I mean, and I, I, I mean, I've had countless experiences. Like the best thing is to have very good gender balance, and you know, women and men working together. And I've had wonderful experiences, for example, uh, with the European Commission and other European institutions, which had very good, I thought, gender balance at the leadership levels on the, on the topics I worked on. Um, and that has been like a, a huge pleasure and, and um, a, a wonderful work environment um, and, and felt like there was real progress and avoided again some of that, that kind of hyper competitive sort of environment. And just to note at the national level now we see a number of nations moving more towards a well being economy. Um, and before we came on, you know, we were talking about, you know, sort of um, a traditional negative peace conception would be just the absence of war, whereas like, you know, these progressed notions of positive peace is like really flourishing societies with economic well-being, no structural violence or less structural violence and economic prosperity, et cetera, et cetera, uh, social educational development. And um, these many of the, the countries that are pursuing um, this well, new well-being economy model, which is a positive peace model, are women, like in Finland and in New Zealand, et cetera. So I think this is really important. The, yeah, the more we have gender balance and we let you know, the, the natural or, or whatever learned <laughs> leadership qualities of women and men together harmoniously to, to, to thrive, then we'll all thrive. It'll be very positive. And I have two million questions, but there's a movie that we were about to watch. So I have a question for Rhonda, but in case anybody has a question and wants to skip me and want to write in the chat or whatever, or else I will ask Rhonda. So we said about uh, peace, women, you are you are in Sudan, you are in Africa, you are in Bangladesh, you are in many places. Was there a specific moment when peace did occur, when you least expected it? And what made that moment really happen? Because it's uh, really, at the end of the day, peace happens when it's on the ground, it's amongst people, it's uh, really something special happening. Is there some real life experience that you can share with us about why that happened and how it happened? Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, I, I'm going to give way more thought to that for the future for other examples, but I do, but you know, just some, a couple of things that come to mind is, um, I mean, I don't know if this is exactly answering, but when I was in the Rohingya refugee camps, um, towards the end of the first year of the response, uh, they established a bit of a local governance system in the camps. So they held local elections, actually, of Rohingya refugee leaders, and they wanted to make sure it was gender equality, gender equity. So there had to be some female Rohingya leaders, which actually didn't even exist prior. Um, but it turned out to be quite a successful thing. I attended the first uh, results of the first election of, of these local Rohingya leaders in one particular camp and, and the women were there. And it was very awkward because they weren't used to that kind of approach, but it was to you know, help guide better solutions for, for the situation because they were facing uh, you know, tensions and and social cohesion issues within the camp. So that, that was a really wonderful initiative that UNHCR actually spearheaded there inside the camps. But um, I heard recently of, um, of, a, of a woman that led a community council in the Taliban area of Northern Pakistan, where there had only been these customary tribal councils, which Maya would know about these 
that issue Sharia law um, decisions basically for communities and they exclude women, they're all male, they're usually clerics. Um, and they often, women are often the answer to the solution to a justice problem. You know, like a woman, a young girl is given away in retribution or this kind of thing. So a woman had actually established an all female Jirga council, what they called a, a local council to, um, to try to balance off this male only um, decision-making process. So I think those are interesting examples. The one thing that's still existing in Afghanistan after all these years is something called community development councils that were developed under a program there for years that's been very successful in the absence of governance or any kind of institutional framework at local, local levels there were these community development councils developed, which are sort of based on actually um, a model of a local spiritual assembly actually, where, and there was good representation there. So they crossed tribal lines and they did bring people together, you know, to come together to solve problems that, you know, weren't based just on specific groups interests. And uh, they're still looking at using those as mechanisms again to deliver um, to people now. Thank you so much. I think we're going to spend a few hours, but I think Carmela is a, a special treat for us. I so appreciate the insights. Even though we spent a very short time, I captured so much and so many new ideas, but really goes down to this justice, this form of really being human. And Carmel, can I hand over to you with this beautiful concept of being human? Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, Maya, for your um your insights that will actually help us to then uh, uh, draw upon. It's difficult for us to answer this question about what is it, how can we achieve true peace without reminding ourselves, what is it that makes us human? The theme of this peace day in 2021 is recovering better for an equitable and sustainable world. And we cannot do that without knowing what is it that makes us human. And it's such a diverse uh, a group, which is delightful to see uh, everybody expressing uh, the same uh, sentiments you see on on, uh, on uh, just juxtaposed and uh, and seeing them side by side so so interwoven interwoven you really feel the the, um, uh, the message of unity of mankind thank you very much really it was very very powerful thank you you're welcome, Alex. Thank you for sharing. So the transition now from many of these people move from a state of awareness to a different one because of something that happened. Uh, and I think awareness is a very powerful uh, element of all that we are. Awareness of what we are, what we think, but also of our actions. I mean, there were some pretty extreme actions there, of course, but also far less extreme actions in what we do that create or destroy peace. Um, and peace, we have this broad, very broad, wide sense of what, uh, you know, world peace. But really, world peace comes from uh, 7 billion people, human beings, actually being peaceful or behaving in certain ways or different ways. So I think the awareness of our very, of our influence in what we do, I think, was a very striking element that really came through in all those interviews. And some were more uh, joking and some more... Uh, uh, heart wrenching, but they all had this in common. I did not realize, now I realize. Thank you, Daniel. Just to follow up really briefly on what you say, I think that maybe we talk about awareness, but this is what brings the human dignity as well is the gift of understanding. You see, we saw that humans, no matter where they were from, no matter what race, background, colors, religion, they all had a gift of understanding, you see? So what we were talking about earlier with Rhonda and Maya is that at different level, when you actually create a space for understanding to be deepened, whether it's at the peace building level, at the international level, at the local level, something kicks in. But we must give space for it and also this equality and recognize the dignity you know, of, of each other as humans. <sighs> I, yeah, I, I, it was such a beautiful, beautiful film. Um, and yeah, really incredible, you know, the thank you at the end by the filmmaker about people sharing so honestly and courageously. I mean, that that's so striking how the heartfelt um, sharing of different people and at, you know, different levels. You have Mary Robinson, who is, you know, the president of a country, but also sharing in such a heartfelt way. And also her talking about leadership, that leadership can be at any level 
um, and it's part of you know structures or a whole community, which is really quite cool. Like also we we all are leaders for for peace and. I love this insight from the woman, one of the women speaking in Arabic. I don't know where she was from, but she said she was like, you know, people wanting to retaliate against each other. She's she's like, forgiveness, forgiveness is freedom and peace. And she talked about when the heart is is purified, like things reset. Or, or, or I can't remember exactly the translation, but forgiveness is freedom and peace. And, and like this, this heart, the heart connection, which also came through. Um, in these these human stories <laughs> was was really really beautiful and, and incredible and also the connection with you know the man probably from the US I think talking about how material things money can't fix you know our you know deepest or, or like basic human needs for love and um, won't get us happiness that was also so so beautiful and and unifying I like the um, the young fellow who was speaking about the Israeli uh, Palestinian issues and how he was initially working against peace, but then he really made a conscious change to work for peace, and you know how that change took place and how he in facilitated that change in somebody else's life um, through a conversation, actually, and uh, you know I, that was really meaningful for me. I just wanted to mention, to comment on the Arabic woman's point about forgiveness, which um, is so important, but you know, at the same time, justice is also important because it's not just a question of forgiving, you know, injustices that have happened or crimes that have been committed. You know, people cannot just forgive and forget, like there, people need to see some form of justice as well. And so we can see that at the level of institution, justice must occur, but at the level of the human, and forgiveness is the peace of mind that you can do, isn't it? To come back to Maya's point about heart, I live in, I think, the only city of the world where you have two official names, you see? It's not as if you had a name in English, a name in Spanish, a name in French. It's that in two, uh, two names for one city officially, which is Derry, London Derry, which is Northern Ireland. And it depends which part you are, <laughs> that you call it in one way or another, with a good heart, and with a lot of generosity, anything is achievable. Peace is possible. No? But with a good heart and generosity, and of course that there are some techniques and treaties and things out there, but without this common sense, it's difficult for us to have, um, to have lasting peace. So I'm going to share with you a special quote um, that is from the Second Secretary General of the United Nations called Doug Commercial. Our work for peace must begin within the private world of each one of us. To build for men a world without fear, we must be without fear. To be a world, to build a world of justice, we must be just. And how can we fight for liberty if we are not free in our minds? How can we ask others to sacrifice if we are not ready to do so? Only in true surrender to the interest of all can we reach that strength and independence that unity of purpose, that equity of judgment, which are necessary if we are to measure up to our duty to the future. As men of a generation to whom the chance was given to build in time a world of peace. Now we're going to try to answer some questions together um, about this idea of unity. And when I talk about unity, please don't misunderstand it with the idea of uniformity but rather as a unit, you see? So if you imagine, and this is something that EBBF, I'm sure, has been uh, you know, uh, um, promoting and exploring, this idea of seeing that we're all the different members of one human body. Nobody can say that a foot or a brain or a heart or a nose or a hand is disunified or disintegrated from the whole. We are all part of one whole. So imagine mankind has been part of a common unit. And the more we are actually feeding into the illness of this body, the more sick we get. The more we are favoriting, um, favorizing the, the, this cure, that is this idea of unity and see, seeing it as a coherent whole, then the more healthy we become. Um, someone posted in the chat uh, words of the Secretary General. I also saw that today he said that 
we face a moment of truth. Now is the time to deliver. Now is the time to restore trust. And now is the time to inspire hope. And isn't it maybe about our humanity, no? And about the fact that we are part of this common unit. Here are some of the questions for us that I selected. So, and Rhonda and, and Maya have, have talked a little bit about it. What do we think that uh, the barriers to unity are? Rhonda mentioned disparity between the rich and poor, gender inequality, is even more lack of education, Rhonda's straightforward racism. It's very wise. She says, um, it is not easy to find peace in ourselves with each other as societies and as societies living together. Mentors, leaders, and examples are so important to inspire and guide. It's a very interesting point that Caroline is making. Unfortunately, she has to go, but these mentors and leaders, I've pondered upon them, you see. What makes John Lennon, John Lennon? What makes Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela? What makes Eleanor Roosevelt such a powerful woman that even today we still follow on her footsteps? Well, I, I thought of it, you see, and in my opinion, it's really the fact that their thoughts, their words, and their actions align. This Greta Thunberg, who's such a young lady, she has a power because when her, as we were saying earlier, you know, this coherence, this understanding that is so uh, uh, clear, it brings a lot of anxiety, you see, when you think that mankind is uh, uh, selfish, but that in your action, you try to promote peace. It's very difficult. <laughs> you cannot blame mankind for being selfish and, and foolish, but at the same time to work for an NGO for peace, no? So it's interesting to see that these people really believe in the human capacity to make a change. And so these mentors and leaders, each one of us can be. No? But it's true, they are important and they inspire us. So to bring it to our daily lives, the second question, help us. What helps us to bring down these barriers? What do we think? Feel free to put it on the chat box. What is it that helps us to bring down these barriers? Maybe you have experienced one of these barriers yourself or you created a barrier. What is it that helps you to bring down these barriers? Yeah, e Eve in the comments <clears throat> said, you know, a big barrier is lack of education. Mm -hmm. And that's so fundamental, is it, isn't it? When we're, when we're talking about, you know, so the very, like the prejudices, um, racism, gender inequality, um, differences of, of wealth. Um, this, if, you know, if people have a grounding and an education and, you know, a formation to, to share more, <laughs> to think about economic equality more, to think, to, to feel deeply, you know, gender equality, racial unity from a very young age. This, of course, will stay with them their whole lives. So education is so, so fundamental. And I find it's, it's, it's quite tough at the adult level to like address issues like gender inequality often um, uh, or racism. People have very, um, you know, entrenched, cultures, it's not impossible, but it gets much more difficult. Um, but if we can have, have good spaces to connect as, as humans, <laughs> maybe, maybe bit by bit we can, um, we can address, um, but it's, it's tricky. Like for example, all the discussions about um, in the US about race you know, after Black Lives Matter, a lot of it was really, really tense and, and very difficult. Um, so, yeah, how do we how do, how do we create the best environments possible to <clears throat> to strengthen unity? Maybe you have some examples from Northern Ireland, Carmel. You're saying there's really strong foundations for peace, but it needs to be nurtured. How do you yeah. nurture the the peacefulness and <clears throat> you know transmuting the old conflicts or the 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 kind of patterning of the cultural the cultural like, adver adversity between the two religious traditions. The peace movement really started at the grassroots here. And it's really people who actually had this coherence between what they think, what they say, and what they do. And the young people also had a very, very tremendous role into really making peace a reality because they were also given the tools to do so, you see, and there were spaces created to hear them out. 
And it's interesting also because from the beginning of our conversation, we said that the three actors in our society, which are the individuals, the communities, and the institutions, if this vision is not common, it's very difficult to move things forward. So this nurturing would happen at that level, you see? Yesterday, we had a, a beautiful event, actually, in Derry, Londonderry, where the mayor of the city, different politicians from different political parties, people at the grassroots level, at the community level, all gathered, and we had a similar screening. It was just wonderful, you see? And uh, it was actually one, one of my hope to, to create, you know, with NetLove, with this consultancy agency of mine, and with other like-minded organizations, a space where we can all come together and discuss about these things. And some may say it's just talking, but no, not really, because then we, we feel inspired, you see, in our daily, daily lives. And I think that what nurtures is also more spaces like this. The last question uh, would be what opportunities do we have uh, in our own lives to strengthen unities in our communities? And maybe I can stop sharing, but what do we think that some opportunities are around us? As we have is, a, is, a, is about work and business and so forth. I think it's also in the office. I think we're not listening to people, giving the space to people. And a lot of the injustice, a lot of the lack of peace is due to people not being heard. You know, Rhonda and Maya started uh, earlier on mentioning this whole concept of people not being heard, feeling there's injustice, people are not treated fairly. Um, so that's all part of a way of being that on a daily basis we can have. And there's two ways, there's three ways. One, if you're the boss, obviously, uh, as a female or male leader, you can decide to implement that. Two, if you're at the receiving end, you don't need to be shutting up all the time. You can say things, ideally in a way that is constructive, positive, that says, you know, this is what I'm feeling, what I'm sensing. I could contribute more if. And the third element is all the people listening. I remember there was... Uh, a famous economist from Argentina said, you know, in, in corruption, there's three people. There's the people that corrupt, the corrupted, and everybody else that just sits there watching without saying anything. So there's all three roles that can really be actively used uh, going forward, remembering the, 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 what the young Kenyan uh, African boy says, I have a mission in my life. I don't know what it is, but I have a mission. So that's not really as a mission, but as a way of behaving, of really standing up intelligently, non-confrontationally with people around us for things that we think are just, supporting them with values and also <laughs> with a coherent behavior. I sometimes some people really marching and being very powerful in certain things and then not being very coherent in their lives. And obviously, I don't think that would work. But there's ways in which, in every single area, we can really make a difference. Actually, what you share reminded me of something that John Burton has said. He's a, an um, uh, Australian diplomat who passed away now. And you know, he's one of the person who has helped to move forward the discourse around problem solving approach. And he was actually in the General Assembly Hall when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was put together in Paris. And so he was saying that there are four ingredients that helps the problem solving approach method to be a reality and have different groups to actually connect. The first one is identity, that you have to actually feel um, seen no? and that your identity is recognized. The second is to be recognized and valued. So not only seen, but also valued for what you are. The third is that you have to feel safe. So your security is uh, vital. And the fourth is that you are asked to participate, you see? that universal participation is happening and that your word actually matter. So these four things are very interesting because isn't it what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights also promotes, no? The fact that you are seen as an identity, as a human, the fact that you are asked to participate in the life of your community and society, that you are safe physically, mentally, intellectually, uh, socially, and that uh, you are uh, recognized and valued, and that you are dignified, and that you are noble in your essence. No? I think that we have seen that also this documentary really, really stressed about one word, which was the word love. And let's not forget that we are still a spiritual being living a, a human experience. I'm going to end with this quote that I think is, is very um, um, a timely and, and of essence for uh, the period of the history that we're living together. It says, uh, it's by a lady called Ruhiye Rabbani, and she wrote that in 1950. And she says, the very flower of the spirit of man is, this, is his capacity for love. Love is not only the strongest cohesive power in society, 
It is the only permanent amalgamator, the only possible force which can produce unity among people, and thus by unity produce order and an atmosphere in which life can function at its highest and best. So happy International Day, everyone. And I leave it up to you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Carmel, for giving us the excuse of celebrating, of honoring, more than celebrating, honoring Peace Day, but especially honoring the work of people like yourself, like Maya, like Rhonda, hopefully like a little bit like every one of ourselves that really is believing in, trying to be coherent and bringing about uh, peace to the world. Uh -huh.